So when we start to talk about Jobs Act or how we're going to move our economy along and what are we going to do, we need to think about that. We need to think about how do we move forward. And it is on that note that I see my colleague from Detroit, who I'd like to call upon, because he has a bill that I want him to speak about, because he knows what it's going to take to get his people in Detroit back to work. And you know, let's not forget, we are a great country built on manufacturing. That is what made us big. And you know, it is also the city of Detroit that I believe really epitomizes what manufacturing is about. So on that note, I'd like to ask my colleague, the congressman from Detroit, to talk to us and share what he's learned from his district. Well, thank you. And I just want to thank the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Hanabusa, for her commitment to growing our economy, not only here in this country, but we can help the world by we in the United States manufacturing the best products and creating the best technologies. I have introduced a bill called the Detroit Jobs Trust Fund. It will create jobs in Detroit. And Detroiters really need it because we've got the highest unemployment rate. We've lost more jobs than any metropolitan region in this country during the last 10 years. But as Ms. Hanabusa pointed out, investing in Detroit not only creates jobs for Detroiters, it'll put Americans throughout this country back to work. And that's because in spite of Detroit's troubling economic situation, high unemployment rate, we still have the manufacturing know-how and we have the well-trained workforce to put Americans back to work, especially in the area of advanced manufacturing. So when Detroit makes its streets safer by hiring more police officers, more firefighters, and properly deploying them, when we improve and reform our public education system by opening more high-quality schools, hiring more teachers who can do the job, and when we reduce the cost of living and doing business in Detroit by cutting some very high municipal taxes, those factors, safe streets, good schools, low taxes, that will attract investment back to the city. Now, if you take a look at the city of Detroit, you'll see that we have a lot of vacant property. Well, that's land ready for a big plant to be located there. And by capturing the existing federal tax revenue that Detroit individuals and Detroit businesses already pay and have that money placed in a trust fund administered by the Department of Treasury to be invested in Detroit to hire those police officers hire and train those teachers and to cut taxes, we can bring employers back to Detroit to hire Detroiters, but also we can resurrect our manufacturing powerhouse in Detroit and create those jobs throughout the country. The same way Detroit did back in World War II, Detroiters built the arsenal of democracy that helped win World War II and save this country and this world from fascism. It was Metro Detroiters manufacturing know-how that built some of the best cars in the world and that created millions of jobs worldwide and especially in this country. So in the same way, by investing in Detroit, in the Detroit workforce, in the Detroit winning spirit exemplified by the Detroit Tigers and the Detroit Lions, we can put our people back to work, we can make this country even stronger in advanced manufacturing and help uplift the quality of life for everyone around the world. I appreciate you giving me this time, the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Hanabusa, for talking about an important issue, putting Detroiters back to work. If I can just say it as a final note, I mentioned this last night, getting a job is important because um, many years ago in this last big recession we had in the 1980s, uh, I was without a job and I lost hope and that can be devastating, not only devastating economically and financially to people, but it can be devastating to a, the spirit of a human being. So a job gives somebody a paycheck 
but it gives a person self-worth and the dignity and the uplifting spirit that they need to keep marching on. And that's what this country is all about. You know, we had to deal with obstacles, but as Americans, we can turn those obstacles into opportunities. That's why immigrants are so successful when they come here to this country, because they see this country for all its richness, for all its opportunity, and they seize it. I'm just asking for that same opportunity to be available for Detroiters to put our country back to work. Thank you again. Thank you. Before you leave, I just wanted to, uh, to extend this discussion because I think that we tend to think about things like when we talk about Detroit and we think about manufacturing, which of course is what we are all focusing on, we tend to forget how that one industry then multiplies out and how it, it creates other jobs. And let me share with you because one of the oh, things yes. that, uh, and, and you know, the, the, the congressman from Detroit is absolutely correct. There, it is, that is what made our country great. But I grew up uh, working in my family's service station, which later became a situation where we sold auto parts. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I will never, never forget is the fact that when you think about the ability to build a car, many of those parts are not manufactured in Detroit. They come from other places in the United States and they all are put together to make the car. But the subsidiary industry is what my family was in, which is, you know, with wear and tear, it breaks down. So you have a whole secondary market of used auto parts being remanufactured or original equipment auto parts from being manufactured that then creates yet another industry. And when we unfortunately get careless and sometimes through no fault of our own, you know, the flagpole or the street light jumps in front of our car and we, we hit it or something, you know, that whole other industry of repair. So, you know, would the good congressman from Detroit want to elaborate about what a great, just investing in Detroit isn't only for Detroit, but I'm sure within Michigan and within all the neighboring states, we probably have great examples of how small industries are just going to start to kickstart. Colin, you're absolutely right. Creating those jobs in Detroit will have a ripple effect throughout this country. And I'm glad you mentioned about remanufacturing. That's the best way to have make it in America jobs. Actually, I was able to visit a remanufacturing plant right outside the city of Detroit two weeks ago. It's fascinating what they do. These are not used units. These are totally remade, and actually these are better units and, 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 and pieces of equipment than uh, if you actually bought something new. So instead of, instead of U.S. manufacturers buying new products overseas that are made overseas, they can buy great remanufactured units right here at home, putting Americans back to work. So you're absolutely right about that. Thank you very much, and you know, that is why, you know, I'm a proud co-sponsor of your bill because I think that, that, that you've hit it, that we, we start with some place like Detroit where people clearly know that work ethic, that work ethic started in places like Detroit, and then from there we're going to build, and we're going to rebuild this country because it has such a great impact all the way through. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for supporting Detroit and supporting Americans going back to work. And we're going to make it in America. We are going to make right. it in America. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Speaker, I also note that we have an, a, a person who probably all the small business guys would love to get their hands on. And I know for my constituents, they would love to have the ability to talk to someone from the great state of Delaware because, of course, when we think of Delaware, we think of financial institutions, we think about how they control our money, but he also is a proud member of the original Noble Nine, and I'm asking him to speak to us about and share with us what he knows from his great state. So the congressman from Delaware, who I would like to add is the only person um, who, well, there may be others, but he is the only person dear to me who actually has less people in his uh, in his congressional delegation than me. So with that. Thank you uh, to my colleague from Hawaii, one of the other small states. I know you're, you're a delegation of, of two, and we're a delegation of one. I, I 
represent this, the whole state of Delaware. I tell my constituents that uh, we have two senators and one member of Congress. That means that I have to work twice as hard, Mr. Speaker, uh, to uh, serve the people in my state. I'm pleased to join my freshman colleagues on the Democratic si side of the aisle this afternoon for our discussion about uh, small business and, and job creation. And I'd like to talk for a little bit about the uh, situation in, in my state, the state of Delaware. We're coming off, all of us are coming off a district work week where we spent our time, I'm sure, meeting with constituents, talking to business owners, small, small business owners, large business owners, uh, working our districts. And I did the same thing uh, in Delaware, not too far from, from the capital here. And I'd like to highlight uh, two meetings that I had in particular. One was a job fair that we held in Georgetown, Delaware, which is the county seat in the lower part of our, of our state. Many of uh, people from the Washington, D.C. area know Georgetown they, as they pass through it to go to our lovely beaches during the summertime to enjoy time with the family at the beach. This particular day, we had uh, sponsored a job fair in Georgetown, along with Senator Carper and Senator Coons. Uh, this was a program that Senator Coons championed in uh, Wilmington initially, and we've moved it now to the other two counties of our state, had a job fair in Dover and a job fair in Georgetown this past week, really helping to connect those folks in our state that are unemployed or underemployed, people looking to move up uh, with employers who are looking to hire. And even though we have 9%, over 9% unemployment nationally, and a little bit over 8% unemployment in our state of Delaware, there are still a lot of jobs that go wanting mostly because the employers are not able to find uh, people that have the required skills for that particular enterprise. So the good news about this job fair is that we had 55 employers there, many of whom were prepared to hire people and offer them jobs, certainly take resumes and, and interview people or set, set up interviews. But we had over 8,000 people who came uh, seeking employment or seeking uh, an upgrade in their current job situation. And that's a lot of people in the small uh, state of Delaware and in the, the uh, least populous area of our state. So it tells us the very serious problem that we have with uh, the lack of jobs and the lack of skills that people might have the jobs to do the jobs that are out there. Later on in the week, I met uh, at Pat's Aircraft, which is uh, an airplane, a manufacturing facility at Georgetown Airport, and they've been hiring mechanics, airplane mechanics, over the last several years. And in fact, when I was lieutenant governor, one of the biggest problems that they had was finding workers that had the requisite skills to do, to do the jobs that they have. Now, they've since lost some of that work, but they were looking ahead and anticipating with some assistance from the FAA to extend the runway there at uh, Georgetown Airport. Uh, going back to your point about the ne need for I infrastructure to stir uh, business development, big business growth, and job creation. If we were able to uh, extend that air, the, air, the um, runway there at the airport, uh, Pats would be able to hire uh, more mechanics. But there are a lot of people out there, while they might want those jobs, would not have the skills to, to do the work. And so uh, Delaware Technical and Community College with the help of the state government, has developed a tra training program specifically to prepare uh, workers for that facility and other airplane manufacturing facilities in our region. We have a Dassault Falcon plant, uh, which does airplane uh, maintenance uh, and mechanics at the Newcastle County Airport, as well as a large Boeing facility over the line in southeastern Pennsylvania. So these are jobs, they're highly skilled jobs. They're jobs that require mechanical ability. They're jobs that require training. And there are certainly lots of folks out there that, uh, that are looking for employment. And these are the kinds of jobs that we need to prepare people for. So uh, one of the meetings I had this week, the press conferences we had, was at Delaware Technical and Community College, where we highlighted a federal grant that was going to Delaware Tech uh, to create training programs for, p for businesses, basically, uh, to enable people to upgrade their skills uh, to take the jobs that are available. So one of the problems, obviously, that we have in our country, and the President's uh, Employment Council uh, has identified this problem, is that we have jobs that are out there, 
but we don't have people with the right kind of skills for those jobs. And so we need to have programs, and this is where the public sector uh, comes into play, particularly a technical and community colleges, uh, to provide those, uh, that training and those skills for those f folks. Later on in the week, I met and, and spoke with the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce. And the Georgetown Chamber, of course, is comprised mostly of very small businesses. And, and really, what they, they had a really simple message for me as a member of Congress. And that is that they see their businesses struggling based because of a lack of confidence among consumers. And when you think about the U.S. economy writ large, about 70 percent of economic activity is consumer driven. And so when consumers don't have confidence, either in their employment situation in the present, they may not be employed, or their fu future employment uh, situation, they're not willing to spend money on small business services or products in the community, and therefore these small businesses uh, suffer. So their message to me was really a simple one, twofold. One is, do no harm in Washington, D.C. Uh, do the work of the people, solve the problems that we have, and inspire confidence. And I think one of the ways that we can do that, there's a lot of discussion. Most of the discussion that I hear from my constituents in the state of Delaware, and we've had town hall meetings. We're going to have a town hall, telephone town hall meeting tonight. I'm sure I'll hear the same thing. Enough of the partisan bickering back and forth across the aisle. Let's focus on the challenges that we face, creating jobs and strengthening businesses, creating a business climate in the short term where business can, is, businesses can thrive, where consumers can have confidence, uh, so they'll be willing to spend on small businesses and other procur procurement. And in the long term, address our deficits, our debt, and our budget imbalances. If we're able to do that, we'll at least provide some confidence to the people that we represent that those that they send to Delaware, the members of the House of Representatives here and our senators across the Capitol, are, are doing their part, are working together, are focused on not the politics of where we all stand in relation to the next election, but on solving the problems that face our country. I think the vote that we have coming at the end of this year, that will be the result of the work of the, of the uh, committee on the budget, uh, will be maybe one of the most important uh, votes in a number of years. I've heard our Majority Whip, Senny Hoyer, refer to it as the most important vote here in the last 30 years. And I think that's right in many respects because people out there, my constituents, your constituents, Ms. Hanabusu in Hawaii, I see our colleague from Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Cecilini has joined us as well. Our constituents are asking us, begging us to do our work, to inspire confidence, uh, and to do the right thing for the country. And that involves giving people the skills they need, uh, to uh, be able to do the jobs that are available out there, creating confidence so businesses can make investments, so people will be willing to spend money and consume, so our economy uh, will get back on its feet again. And so in the long term, we'll set up a fiscal situation with our government uh, so that uh, the economy can be strong and create jobs for my children uh, and their children. So I want to thank you. Uh, I thank my colleague from Hawaii for leading our, uh, our dialogue this afternoon on, on job creation, on small business development across our country in our respective districts. And I look forward to uh, sitting here with you for a few more minutes and uh, engaging in this dialogue. Thank you once again. I just wanted to give a, a few words about how the people in Delaware are responding to the work that we're doing or not doing uh, here in, uh, in, in Congress. So I want to thank the speaker for the opportunity to address the chamber this afternoon. Thank you. Before the congressman from Delaware sits, <laughs> I just wanted to explore one thing, because when I was in district, one of the comments I got was about the dysfunctional Congress. But one of the things that I asked them to really sit back and look at, and this is really our friends in the media, and they've got to do something about the way they report. I told them that you know, when they ask about our votes, 
they should really look at it seriously and say, okay, how many votes are really that controversial? And how many votes, uh, how many times are we just adversaries and how many times are it that there are just a handful of votes relative to how many we pass in the House that, that rises to the level of that people would say that we are just cutting down partisan lines? Because I don't really think that, that that's the case. It's a minority of votes, but, but it's that which is played up. And when I tell my constituents that, they're, they're, they're sort of amazed. They think every single bill that we practically pass up here is controversial. Did you, did you get that sense from talking to your constituents? Well, I absolutely got that sense. And the people were, frankly, that I talked to, Democrats, Republicans, it really didn't matter what party affiliation they had, were pretty uh, fed up with what they had seen in the whole debt ceiling debacle. Not, not so much the debate around it, but the fact that we let it go to the brink and that we seem to want to, to every continuing resolution, every important vote, take it to the brink uh, before uh, coming together, however that might happen, whether it's one side of the aisle getting enough votes or whether it's coming across the aisle and having a bipartisan approach. Frankly, uh, the people in Delaware are more uh, focused on having us address problems mm -hmm. and solve those problems, and they're not really concerned at all, in fact, uh, with the politics of it. What they tell me is cut it out. I cut it out, and they ask me, is it uh, so bad? And I, I tell them I've been reading a lot of Civil War history. Uh, of late, I read a, a, a book about Abraham Lincoln about a year ago, and after that started looking for other uh, books to read. And, of course, when we were just after we were sworn in, uh, one of our leaders, uh, Congressman Larson from Connecticut, gave us a history of the House of Representatives. That's right. And because I had been doing so much reading about the Civil War, I decided to go first to those chapters just before the Civil War, during the Civil War and afterwards, and to read about the history of the House of Representatives. And I want to tell you, it may be hard for some of our constituents in Hawaii and Rhode Island and Delaware to believe it, but things were a lot worse <laughs> during those period of time. One of the stories uh, was related in the book that one member almost caned another member to death on the floor of the House. I tell my constituents, it's not nearly that bad. In fact, uh, we have a lot of friends. Frankly, I have a lot of friends. I know you do across the aisle. I think the real problem is we have pretty significant differences of opinions on, right. on issues, and that's understandable. That's what makes our country so great, frankly, that we that's can right. come here. We can come from our respective areas of the country with different points of view. Uh, as I look around this chamber, you see America in this mm -hmm. chamber uh, w through the representatives that are sent here uh, by the people. But we need to understand that this country is greater than all the rest of us as individuals and that we need to live up to the greatness of our country by recognizing that we've got to put our differences at the end of the day uh, beside us, behind us, uh, so that we con can come to some resolution for the good of the people at large. That's a great message. The whole is greater than the parts. Thank you.